So, okay, today I will talk about, uh, yeah, as you heard, our estimator for the expected information gain, which uses um, nested randomized quasi Monte Carlo. And yeah, this is joint work with Andre Calon, uh, who I believe is in the audience. <clears throat> Uh, Luis Espas, Sebastian Kumschat, and of course, my PhD supervisor, Raul Zimpone. So, yeah, let's get started. Um, I think here, yeah, okay, I show you first what we want to do. We want to estimate nested integrals. What I mean here is we have a function. I hope you can see my pointer here. We have a function G of two variables. We integrate over one of those variables. This is one integral, then we apply a nonlinear function, f, here, and then we integrate over the other variable also. And we approximate this uh, using sample averages. And here we also have this nested structure where for each outer sample, basically, we need a whole inner approximation. Um, yeah, for samples y in this unit hypercube in, in dimension d1 and x in dimension d2. And the application we have in mind, but this can really be applied in, in many fields and for many problems. What we would like to do is approximate this expected information gain. And for this, I will uh, introduce this in more detail later for the numerics, but here for us, the nonlinear function f is the logarithm and the inner integrand g is the likelihood in, in the Bayesian setting. So for, for observation data y, for example, and model parameters x. And okay, so I start here with with the introduction of the uh, basics of the all the concepts and terms that we need. I assume most of you are familiar with this here, so I can go quickly. This is um, one of the easiest or conceptually most straightforward ways to approximate an integral. This is Monte Carlo approximation, where we draw IID samples. So basically, the the question always is, how do you pick your sample points where to evaluate your integrand, right? And so for Monte Carlo, we use IID points and there's not many um, issues here. The very light uh, assumptions that you have to make for your integrand. And then what you get is, so we always want to look at the error <clears throat> of this approximation. <clears throat> and yeah, we have no bias error, of course, as you're probably familiar with, we can compute this here. Monte Carlo is an unbiased method. We do have a statistical error. Um, so, yeah, so here we, we just do this error splitting and then we can split into bias error, statistical error. This will always be um, the method of choice. For us, the statistical error, we can analyze using the central limit theorem. So with a certain large probability, one minus alpha, we have that the statistical error is bounded by this term here um, that depends on the variance of the integrand and the rate can be extracted here <clears throat> quite easily. It's basically m to the minus one half. So m is the number of samples. If we say want to reduce the, the error by a factor, uh, want to reduce it to half the error, we need four times as many samples. If you want one tenth the error, we need a hundred times as many samples. And this is independent of the dimension d, right? We, we approximate an integral in dimension d. It does not show up here in this error bound. This is good. What is not so good is this rate m to the minus one half. Um, yeah, and, and we have a confidence constant. So basically the, the larger this probability, also the larger this constant here, and it's the inverse of the f of this alpha. And it only holds as the number of samples goes to infinity, this, this argument. Okay, so what we can also do to increase the speed of this uh, error convergence is instead of using IID points, we use some other points here the deterministic low discrepancy points. An example here, this is the, the first 16 points of the Sabal sequence in two dimensions. <clears throat> and yeah, what's the problem with IID points? The problem is you can see up here, <clears throat> there are large areas of empty space, basically. There are no points here, no points there or here. Points are clustering and there's really no way to prevent this, right? If I, if I say I double the number of points, sure, I may be able to fill those gaps, but I may also not. There's there's no guarantee that I will get here or there for any finite number of points. On the other hand, uh, for the 
support sequence, the structure of these points guarantees that if I split the domain into these, for example, here 16, I mean, this is basically an arbitrary more or less um, splitting, but you can see that they have the quality that they fill the space well. Each of those um, sub intervals contains exactly one point. Um, if you assume that the lower left corner um, <clears throat> is included in, in this corresponding rectangle, then each of these 16 rectangles contains one point. If I, sorry. Um, and then if I were to split this again to, into, say, 64 of, the each, uh, of these sub intervals, and I increase the number of points, I, I again, I know each of those sub intervals will contain exactly one point. So I, I have some some control over how to fill the space with these points. And what does this do? If we use those points instead, we get the quasi Monte Carlo estimator. So here it basically looks almost the same as the Monte Carlo estimator, except I use different points. So I denote them T, those are the deterministic you know, low discrepancy points. So the, the low discrepancy, I will not go into detail, but basically means yeah, that, that we have some control that the, the space is filled well. And then, Again, we look at the error, we split into bias and statistical error, of course, since this is deterministic, the expectation here of IQMC is it's a deterministic variable, so the expectation doesn't do anything. Um, so, so now we have a bias. Um, and this bias error is bounded by the coxman lafkin inequality, like this, we have the logarithm of n to the d, then we have the hardy cross variation of g that I will get into in a, in a couple of slides. But the important thing is we have to rate one over M essentially. Okay, this logarithm term is a bit, um, yeah, not too intuitive what is happening. So we, we write it like this. Many people um, choose to use this notation or, or something related. So we have a constant here that basically encapsulates this log term. As we let M go to infinity, this, this basically um, is neglectable compared to this. So we say the rate is one minus some small epsilon. Okay. And yeah, statistical error, as I said, the expectation here doesn't do anything. So there's no, no statistical error. It's a deterministic method. Okay, but this Hardy cross variation, um, usually we cannot compute it. And there's other issues. So how do we deal with this error bound? Can we use it at all? Um, what people often do is they randomize the points. And one way of doing this is um, Owen scrambling. So yeah, most of this talk will be based on on these Sobol points and Owen's uh, scrambling mechanism. How does it work? On the left, we have again these um, deterministic points. And then what you might think about is okay, if if I print this out, right? This is just uh, motivation, but basically here's how it works. If I were to print this out on a piece of paper and I cut here lengthwise in half then I can apply a, a random permutation, right? I can shuffle these strips randomly. Either I keep everything the same or I permute left and right. Then I cut along here and also here. And for each of those, again, I can either um, exchange or, or not exchange. I again apply a random permutation and I go on in this manner. I cut here, I cut here, and I, I cut this into final, final pieces and every time I either switch them or I don't switch. And what happens is that in the end, yeah, and then I do it um, not just along these um, vertical lines, but also horizontally independent for the dimension. And then what happens is that every point will be <clears throat> um, a, a random variable in, in zero one in two dimensions, but they, all still know about each other. I would still have this property that each of these boxes contains exactly one point. And we see this on the right. So now they're scrambled. I applied this, this scrambling technique. Um, so each point is now uh, uniform in zero one, but still every box contains one point with probability one. It, it, can, it can fail a little bit. I can randomly permute a point to the top right corner and then it's technically in the, in the next corner, but we will I'm not be dealing with this here. With probability one, this works. So we, we retain the low discrepancy sequence, but we have a random sequence. What do we gain from this? Now we can use basically um, uh, a sample approximation of the variance. And again, we have some, some practically usable error bound. 
Okay. So, and here, this is the randomized QMC estimator now. So basically the way I write this is here. Um, I, I again approximate this integral using now M of those low discrepancy points that the ministry wants the TM. So I write this X here as, as rho, rho is the randomization. I apply it to all, one randomization, I apply to all points at the same time, basically. So they all keep their structure, they keep their knowledge about each other, they're still dependent. And then I apply multiple randomizations and then I average also over these randomizations. And the randomizations are independent. So then I can take the sample variance over the randomizations actually. Okay, so, and this of course means that again, I will have an unbiased method. So I show it here, but it's uh, yeah, pretty straightforward that the randomization removes the bias from the estimator, but now of course I get a statistical error because now it's a, uh, not no longer deterministic. Okay, but hopefully this will be easier to control than the previous bias error. So this looks pretty similar to Monte Carlo. Basically I have a very high probability that this error now is below this bound, where again I have a confidence constant and then this, this uh, yeah, standard deviation basically, square root of the variance of this estimator now. Um, so now what do we know about this variance? We, of course we know that this variance decreases at rate r to the r to the minus one half. The number of randomizations is just Monte Carlo. Of course, this this doesn't really do us any favors, but um, yeah, basically also we know that it will decrease at rate m to the minus one plus epsilon, right? This QMC rate. So the idea is keep the number of randomizations low, increase the number of points, and then you get a faster um, error convergence than for Monte Carlo, hopefully. Um, the kind of price that we have to pay here is that the central limit theorem is usually not, not applicable straightforward anymore. So uh, yeah, I use the Chebyshev inequality here and we get a, a higher confidence constant one over square root of alpha. Okay, so now coming back to this Hardy-Cross variation here, it's defined. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit of an involved concept, so I will not go into details here. What is important if you see for, for D1, um, you have the integral over the absolute value of this derivative of the integral. So you can already see for the example we had for the logarithm, this is infinite. The logarithm, right? If you integrate, uh, if, you, if you take the derivative of the logarithm, it's one over z. Then if you integrate from zero to one, you get the, the log of one minus the log of zero. So it's infinite. Um, so here we have to be careful. Does not mean that the method doesn't work. It just means that this bound is not uh, useful here. And then for multi D it's, it's defined um, recursively. So, but in, in principle we have the same issue. Um, yeah, so the Hardy cross variation, which shows up in this coxman lafka inequality for the deterministic QMC bound, but it also affects uh, the, the randomized. So for, for theoretical purposes, of course, we need to deal with this to show that also the, the error of the randomized QMC is bounded um, in some way. So we have to be more careful. And what Owen came up with is he says, okay, this, in the, this basically the mixed first derivatives of the integrand, they are allowed to blow up at the boundary, but not too fast, right? For the Hardy cross variation, it's just, if it blows up, then the bound is out the window, it's infinity. We lose all um, control on the error. But what he says here, okay, let's assume that we have this um, this quantity here, this mixed first derivatives are bounded by some constant times product over the dimension. And then basically as, as y goes to zero or, or y goes to one, this um, blows up at some rate given here by these a i's. Okay, we have a one here whenever we, we take the integral over this dimension. It's not, not so important, I think here. Um, yeah, and I also already say here f, just to indicate again that for us, the problem will be the logarithm and this will be the outer function f. Okay, but assuming now that we have this, that um, the the outer integrand blows up, but not too fast, what we gain, we have this result saying that the, um, the QMC or randomized QMC error 
in L1 sense is bounded here, some constant terms, and then there's rate here, n minus one, and, and, and to the, yeah, one minus epsilon minus the maximum over these a's, right? So before we had this, okay, now those are the outer samples, but I said m, m, m to the one minus epsilon was the rate for QMC. If we have this unbounded integrand, we pay the price of having to account for these AIs, which signify the, the speed at which the integrand blows up, basically. The faster it blows up, the worse the QMC conversions, right? But this, for some small A's, or even A close to zero, um, the Hardy cross variation would be infinite, so we get no error bound, but here we, we still get a useful error bound. And then a corollary, this also works for the L2 error with the same bound. Yeah. And here in the numerator, again, we have a constant that goes to infinity as the dimension increases, but only in this log sense. Okay, and with those in hand, we can now go back to the um, nested estimator that we wanted to actually analyze. But before going to QMC, now again, I introduce this baseline of the nested Monte Carlo estimator, which people actually use, um, or yeah, was, was introduced in 2003 by Ryan and then later analyzed by Raul and Luis and, and uh, Joachim and, and other members of the group, I believe, um, in 2018. So this is the double loop Monte Carlo estimator. Basically, we use Monte Carlo for both the inner and outer points, IID points. Um, yeah, and we can approximate this integral. Of course, then next thing is always to analyze the error. Now we have a bias error and a statistical error. Okay, the inner Monte Carlo is unbiased. We know that the outer Monte Carlo is biased and bias comes from this inner variance. Okay, because the, for a finite number of points, this inner approximation will not be exact typically, even though it's unbiased, um, it will be off. And, and by how much it will be off, this affects the outer Monte Carlo. So in this basically some constant over M this bias error, M is the number of inner samples. And then the statistical error here, I, I don't go through this central rhythm theorem argument, argument. I just show the um, the square root of this variance, right, of the estimator. So if, if you um, look at only this term here, it's again, basically this rate n to the minus one half that we had before, but then there's also this mixed term that shows up, but, but basically this is kind of intuitive, I think. So yeah, and then of course you have to control the bias error and the statistical error, making the overall estimate for the nested integral, of course, more expensive than just for a single integral. Okay, so now finally coming back to what we wanted to discuss, the randomized quasi Monte Carlo estimator for expected information gain. So here for, for the nested integral. Um, so what we do now is we use randomized uh, low discrepancy points or QMC points for both the inner and the outer samples. And what does it look like? First, the outer points are, are straightforward. We have, okay, here we call it U, um, low discrepancy points and um, N, N of those points. And then we have the randomization row and we have S of those. And then for the inner points, it looks a bit more involved we have the T low discrepancy points. We apply here on the outside the, the R randomizations to, to kind of get this um, uh, practical error bound, but also for theoretical purposes, for each outer sample, we have to apply in the middle another randomization um, so that also for each outer sample, the inner samples will be independent. And yeah, we can kind of uh, control this overall variance. Okay, but in, in principle, this, this this doesn't really do anything, right? We we just apply more and more randomizations, and then um, yeah, we again get the points that that we want to use. Okay, and now in this work that um, is on archive, I I encourage everyone to have a look and and let me know if you find something interesting or uh, yeah. So this this is our work, and um, I will show the the link in a, in a minute. Um, basically, the bias here is this rate m to, uh, one over m to the two minus two epsilon. So yeah, basically, 
we get an increase from one over m to one over m squared. And the statistical error, again, if you first look at this first term, we have this square root of one over n squared minus two epsilon minus two. So yeah, basically we get from n to the minus one half to n to the minus one. Um, but we have to pay this price here. So with these AIs again, is the, the speed at which the logarithm um, blows up. But of course the, the logarithm is nice and, and blows up very slowly. So we can use um, basically any, any positive A here will do. But um, yeah, we have to keep track of this anyway. We cannot just use the cox malafka inequality um, directly. And then we have also this mixed term. Um, yeah, with the m squared, but also here n is just a Monte Carlo rate. And this comes from the fact that for each, as I said, for each outer sample, we have to use independent inner samples. Um, so here, okay, but this term will basically be um, negligible compared to this term on the left anyway. So for us, this is fine, does not affect the overall all um, performance of the estimator. Um, yeah, it may be able even to get a better rate here, but um, since this term is, is small anyway, asymptotically, um, yeah, this is what we have for now. And and it would mean that we have to introduce a more complicated dependent structure here. Um, okay, so, and then I will not go through the details of this proof, but this is basically the core of our work to bound this um, bias and variance. So I would just uh, briefly mention the assumptions that we had to make um, so that you can see what what really distinguishes kind of the, the Monte Carlo from the quasi Monte Carlo, meaning that if you want to use this quasi Monte Carlo, you need um, stricter assumptions, you, you need more um, favorable properties from your integrands. So basically the, the F, okay, we do this notation here, just if you take the expectation over these inner samples of the inner integrand, I denote this G bar, so this is basically, if you could do, do the inner integral in closed form, then this would be G bar. And then F of evaluated at this G bar times some constant. Um, yeah, some constant between zero and two here. So basically in, in, in some, some ball around this G bar it needs to be in certain subvolume spaces. For the bias error to be finite, we need it to be in this first subvolume space with uh, three derivatives and, and p times integrable. For the, the variance error to be finite, we need it to be in this other subvolume of space with only two derivatives, but two p integrable for some p. Um, yeah, the, that comes from, from our Hölder argument that we use. Um, and we also need that, um, yeah, that f um, apply, uh, evaluated at this g bar needs to satisfy this boundary growth condition by Owen, that it doesn't blow up too quickly, as I already mentioned. And we also need this monotonistic, um, monotonicity assumption. Um, okay, and for the inner integrand, um, what we assume here is that the, the Hardy cross variation of G as a function of the outer variable basically is bounded by, again, this, this G bar in some sense, and that this G bar is in some L4Q space where Q is the Hölder complement of this P that I introduced. So I, I need a lot of um, a lot of assumptions here that basically we uh, showed for our application. But of course, if you have a different application in mind, you would have to check all of those. And yeah, for, for Monte Carlo, basically the only assumption you need is, okay, I need L2, I need a, a finite variance, and then more or less you're good to go. Okay. And um, okay, what I didn't mention here is that we also are, of course, here doing applied maths and doing applied maths often, not always, but often means that we need um, to solve a PDE or need to solve an SDE. We need often to approximate this G, um, yeah, uh, using finite elements, for example. And we can also do this, but for the sake of this presentation, um, I didn't want to um, include yet more um, notation. So, but basically we can, uh, under, under sufficient assumptions, we can also use this um, QMC method for an approximate G that depends on some mesh size. Okay. 
Um, yeah, and then what is the setting? Once we have analyzed the error, we want to know what is the cost of our estimator. So the, the overall error, we split into bias and statistical error, we save, I mean, this is of course here at the, at the Yuko chair, but also at the group at cost, or is the setting. You give me a tolerance, an error tolerance, and say, please um, find an estimate that is below this error tolerance. I say, okay, I have my error estimate. What can I do to ensure that I'm below this tolerance with a certain probability, of course. And then I can find the optimal number of inner and outer samples. Um, let me briefly have a look at the time. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, and what I find is that, or what, what we found is that the optimal number of inner samples behaves as, um, as tall to the minus one over two, basically. And the outer samples n tall to the minus one. Um, yeah, and then a little bit worse as, as the tolerance goes to zero, right? And for Monte Carlo, this would be tall to the minus one and this would be tall to the minus one half. Okay, and then of course the cost is just the product is n times m. Um, okay, so I summarize here many of these estimators. The, um, the computation work that needs to be done. So for Monte Carlo, it's straightforward. Um, basically here, I didn't really do anything, right? I, I, the, the cost of Monte Carlo is m, and I know that the, the error is uh, tall to the minus one half. So I, I move to the other side, I get that this is tall to the minus two. So as I said, if I, if I, if I half tall, the cost um, grows at a factor four. If I um, want tolerance of, of one tenth, I, I need a hundred times as many samples. Okay, for the randomized QMC estimator, I have the, the number of samples, which is also the cost that I need for a certain tolerance is tall to the minus one over one minus epsilon basically, but close to minus one. So if I want to half the error, I only need um, twice as many samples, right? So this is much more efficient here. And for the double loop Monte Carlo estimator, of course, the, the cost will be the product of inner and outer samples, right? For each for each outer sample, I need to draw m inner samples, so I have n times m total samples, and this will be tall to the minus three. Okay, so if I want one tenth of the error, I need a thousand times as many samples. So this is a lot less efficient than than for uh, Monte Carlo standard Monte Carlo sample. Um, approximation. And this comes from the fact that the actually this is all tied back to this nonlinear function, right? The logarithm is nonlinear. So I cannot just do one Monte Carlo approximation because it will bias also the outer Monte Carlo. So I need to, to really make sure that both the bias and the statistical error are controlled. And this, this is why the cost increases here. Okay, one estimator that I didn't yet talk about, but of course that many of you have already worked on is the multi-level Monte Carlo where in this particular setting, um, and this was introduced by, by Goda, for example, and, and Charles, I think, um, is that you can use the multi-level structure for the inner number of samples. So you start with a coarse approximation, for example, only one inner sample. And then you increase, you, you use two inner samples, four inner samples, eight, and so on. And then you can balance those levels. And in the end, you get something that behaves as tall to minus two, same as the non-nested one. So you turn the nested problem into a multi-level problem, and then you're back to this cost in the in the optimal case, of course. I'm sure you're familiar with Charles. This depends on kind of how these how these um, uh, these uh, error and and cost grow as or or decrease as you increase the number of samples. And then in the in the optimal setting for multi-level, you have this cost of tall to the minus two. Okay. And so our estimator, which does not yet use multi-level, we're working on that as well, but it's it's not using any multi-level arguments. It's just replacing, and this is a bit less intru in, intrusive, I, I believe. You only replace the IID random samples by um, the randomized QMC samples. And you get this tall to the minus, okay, basically minus one, minus one half. So it's a bit complicated here. So I wrote it like this, um, cheating a bit, tall to the minus three over two almost. So 
we are cheaper than multi-level. We are cheaper than, of course, double loop Monte Carlo. And those are the two cases we want to compare against. Um, yeah. So basically we are even cheaper than single level Monte Carlo, but it doesn't really make a uh, single loop Monte Carlo, but it, it doesn't make too much sense to compare with this. Okay, the question is how much better are we? Can we achieve this um, rate of the minus three over two? And the answer will be not quite, but at least we can beat the rate two and the rate three um, that other established estimators uh, can achieve. Okay, and here are some works also. So this is the this is the work I was talking about. This is our work that this talk is based on. Um, please have a look. This is the um, original double loop Monte Carlo paper. And here's Giles, uh, yeah, seminal multi-level work. Okay, so now for the applications. Okay, do, do you have any questions before I get to the applications? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, so if I use sparse grids here, what would be complexity? Um, I have not. So I know there's, there's the multi-level um, Monte Carlo paper also by Luis and, and colleagues where they deal with sparse grids. I'm, I'm not too familiar of, of the cuff. Um, I think for the, for the multi-level, yeah, I think it would get something like total minus two would be my guess, but I'm not I'm not sure I would have to follow up with this. I'm sorry. Also, you showed D dimensional case, mm -hmm. uh, but here param dimension D is not here. It's yes. Correct, yeah? yes, this is the nice thing about Monte Carlo is that dimension D doesn't show up. For QMC, it does it does show up. Um, but I'm I'm hiding it here in the big O notation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> okay. For RQMC, the dimension D would be here, and it it would increase as this log to the D, basically. And last question: This is only for logarithm, yeah? Yes. If it's another function, square root or something. Um, else, then... In principle, this works for for any function, any nonlinear uh, for for linear functions. Of course, you get this rate, but for nonlinear functions, um, the the speed at which okay, if if it's if it's very very non-nice, right? If, if it has um, jumps or something, it's a different matter. But assuming you have something that that has a singularity at the boundary, which is the case we're considering, then the speed at which your nonlinear function blows up will be um, uh, basically shows up in these AIs, right? And the, the I goes over the dimension. So for the square root uh, um, blows up, Quicker than the logarithm, right? I guess so, but would still give something like a is is smaller than one half. I think so. You would still get a better rate than um, Monte Carlo. I think. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hi, Arvid. Sorry, one more question. Can mm -hmm. you also comment a bit on this epsilon? I mean, can it get arbitrarily small? Or does it depend on things like the dimension of the problem and so on? Um, yeah, basically, this is kind of the, the trade-off here. I'm I'm not 100% sure for the subal points. I know for sure for the lattice points that I have not introduced. Um, that, yes, we have this kind of trade-off here. This this C, epsilon D, um, yeah, as, as we let D increase, this this blows up. So this this constant C, epsilon D. It it will blow up at this speed. So so if we if we go let epsilon go to zero, this would go to infinity. So we cannot choose epsilon equal to zero. We can we can choose an arbitrarily small epsilon, but then we would also have to use a large m. So for for finite m, uh, this this also does not um, guarantee that we are cheaper for uh, than Monte Carlo. So th this is an an asymptotic thing in m, and then for any fixed D and then you fix that, yeah, th then basically we can increase M and find that here from, from this notation is more clear. Uh, for any fixed D, if I let M code to infinity, this term here would dominate and we get basically the rate one, but yeah, we still have this log term. So, and this is why I say here, it's, it's one minus epsilon, okay? Okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, 
So coming back now to the application, what do we want to um, use this for? This is um, basically the, the main theme of my um, dissertation that I, I hope to um, finish soon and, and then submit is how much do we learn from an experiment? So yeah, let me just briefly, I believe we have some time, introduce the, these concepts. What we're interested in is if you do an experiment, any, any scientific experiment, um, you have to make some choices beforehand, right? You have to usually, okay, so what you want to do is you want to learn about some parameter theta and um, you collect data and you analyze this data um, to, to make kind of draw conclusions about the parameters that you're interested in. But the choices you have to make before actually doing the experiment is, is how to set it up, how to design the experiment. And this, for example, means, okay, I have some, some measurement device, I, I have some camera or, or I dig a hole and I, I put a, a stick in to measure some concentration of something. The question is, where do I take my samples or, or where do I place my sensors? Usually called sensors and sensor placement is one of the main um, issues here when designing experiments. So the question really is, um, how do you set up your experiment? So that the data you will get, and this is all in, in the future tense, so that the data you will get will tell you uh, uh, a lot about the parameters of interest, right? It would be kind of catastrophic in some sense if you go out there, go out into the field, spend millions of dollars or euros or or um, yeah, whatever currency you're using to then find out, okay, the data I got doesn't really tell me anything about the parameters. And then you have to go back out, ask for more money and do it again. So what you want to do is you want to design your experiment in such a way that you optimize the, the amount of information you will obtain, hopefully. So what you can do is you simulate your whole experiment on the computer, and then you run it a couple of times with different designs, and then you can optimize. But what exactly is this function that you're optimizing? It's not um, quite clear or not straightforward. The one we use will be the expected information gain. Of course, there, there are other design uh, criteria, optimality criteria, but this is the one we use. So here in the Bayesian sense, what we say is that these parameters are, are basically fixed. They, uh, usually they, they will be some um, material properties of something that you want to analyze or or some concentration of some uh, yeah, groundwater or, or whatever you want to analyze, right? But we assume a prior density. This is the, the Bayesian idea. Is it's fixed, but we don't know it. So we may as well assign a, a probability density. And this is what we know before doing the experiment. And then after the experiment, um, so, okay, we say here we, we analyze data. Data Y is given as some model. And this usually involves solving a partial differential equation, right? We have Darcy's law, for example, is one, one of the, the main um, things that people analyze. And this mathematical model depends on the parameters and the design, um, because basically yeah, it, we only analyze in, in certain parts of the domain, or yeah, we only see a, a part of of the total um, of the total field, for example, or or only part of the of the pieces that we're analyzing. If we're, for example, in in medical applications where we do um, yeah visualizations, then then we can only see a, certain slices. And then we also have additive noise here. We assume additive noise. So this is a Gaussian variable. Psi is the design. Okay, this I introduced. And yeah, we assume that this is known centered um, Gaussian noise. And then we have the posterior distribution. So the posterior distribution is the distribution of the parameters of interest conditioned on the observed data, right? This is what we would know after the experiment. We don't know yet because once we do the experiment, the question of how to design it has to be answered already. So I talk in future tense here. The posterior density will tell us what we know after the experiment. And then um, basically we still have the, the likelihood, which is if you use, um, yeah, is, is how likely is the, the observed data given certain parameters. And this is easy. Basically the only thing that we have, right? Apart from the prior, because we assume it, but here this is given by this, um, Gaussian distribution in Y, basically. So here we have the with the mean given by the the model predictions, um, and then we have the evidence. And this this is kind of a tricky term. 
So this tells us how likely was it to observe the, or will it be to observe this data? It's not given directly. We condition on, on theta again and uh, marginalize. So this is just simple um, probability calculus and I denote this here theta prime. It's the same theta as, as up here, um, but just for, for notation purposes, I call it theta prime. And so then we have all the ingredients that we need um, to look at the expected information gain here. I define it as a function of xi of the design. Um, and it's basically the integral over the, the logarithm of the posterior minus the logarithm of the prior, right? So what does this tell us? This is basically the, the logarithm is always kind of the, the measure of information in some sense, right? So this is the information we have after the experiment minus the information we have before the experiment. And to me, this kind of makes sense as this is what we learn, right? What we know after minus what we already knew before is what we learn. If if we only know what we what we knew before, we may know a lot, but we didn't learn anything because we already knew it, right? So this quantity is large. If before we didn't know a lot and afterwards we know a lot, and this is what we want. Because this means that the data, depending on the design size, will have given us a lot of information a lot of information about theta. Okay, um, but since the, we don't have this posterior, what we do is we use Bayes' theorem. We rewrite everything in terms of the likelihood and the evidence, which is again, also given by the likelihood. And then you can see, okay, we have one integral here, logarithm, another integral here. And this is uh, where our estimator comes into play. So what, what does this look like? This first term we can compute in closed form. Um, this is also not a nested integral, so but uh, it's even simpler than that. It's just given it's some constant. I call C like, and then we have this nested integral, right? Integral logarithm, another integral of this likelihood. And here we can use our estimator. Okay, and then one more trick that we use because, um, yeah. We started using this for the Monte Carlo estimator. We used important sampling um, because basically up here you can see, okay, this, this term is a little problematic. We have this norm in the likelihood. And this in principle um, is positive because it's it's a Gaussian distribution. It's it's everywhere positive, but numerically it's not. Right? Numerically, if the if the model prediction is very far away from the observed data or the simulated observed data. Um, then this would be close to zero. And this, uh, interestingly enough, the, your this covariance, if this is very small, then the inverse is large. So basically then this, this will also um, mean that this term is often numerically zero. And what does it mean? Then we, we have to solve a PDE here to evaluate G only to find that this term is, is numerically zero. So we get nothing, right? We, we add zero to our estimator. We have to draw another sample. And this makes it very inefficient. Um, so we use important sampling, um, which basically just means multiplying and dividing by this approximate posterior here. We just change the measure. So we um, we, we now can sample from this other distribution, and we have to introduce this likelihood factor to account for this change of measure. But hopefully this this new measure will be more concentrated and we guarantee or we, the, the idea is that this depends on the y xi that we already have from the outside sample. so we sample y first and then we we base the measure of the inner samples on these outer observations so that this will be not be too far off and hopefully not numerically zero okay um and we use the laplace approximation here which is kind of an, a neat trick um, to get estimates of, of some um, integrals over functions that are close to Gaussian. Um, because basically, OK, as a function of y, this is Gaussian. But as a function of theta, this is typically not Gaussian, um, at least not for nonlinear g. So yeah, but it, it may be somewhat Gaussian as a function of theta. And then using the Laplace approximation, um, we basically approximate this by a Gaussian. And then, um, yeah, we get an approximation here. Okay, and, and for Monte Carlo, this works very well. For QMC, unfortunately, this is tricky 
because um, yeah, it messes with uh, the regularity of the function also. So yeah, and and this is um, yeah, there are some works on on this particular problem applying the Laplace approximation in combination with QMC, but um, yeah, we we have not yet investigated this too closely. Okay, so here's the first example. Uh, this is pharmacokinetics. So basically, the question is, um, you have some drug that uh, you give to a patient, and you want to know um, how fast will it be absorbed and then eliminated from the system. So you have some some patient specific parameters, and this is of course a, a very important uh, question um, because everyone is different, and and everyone, um, yeah, has has different has a different situation and and. Medication needs to be, um, yeah, fitted uh, to the patient. So, yeah, what we would like to know is um, how do we how do we measure these um, these patient specific parameters, right? So, what we can do is we can we can administer the drug and then take blood samples and see the concentration, uh, and from this we can gain insight about how how fast is absorbed. And how fast it's eliminated from the system. And the question is over 24 hours here, when do we take samples? Of course, we cannot take just arbitrary number. Of course, we, this is a real person in in the in the real world. So we cannot just you know take blood every every five minutes. So we say okay, over the course of 24 hours, taking blood 15 times already sounds like um yeah, very tough to me, but this is the, the assumption that that was made here by by Goda and colleagues. So they did this for multi-level Monte Carlo, and they they found um, that this is very efficient. So we wanted to compare to their method, basically, and see if we can um, beat them or come close to it at least. So and the question is, did we do it? Well, okay, here, this is the rate we observed, one point seven three. Um, if you remember, the the ideal rate that we got from our theory was one point five to three over two. So we did not get this. We beat the, the Monte Carlo and also Monte Carlo with important sampling, which was rate three, but we also beat the multi-level, which was rate two, right? So we, we did beat them in this sense. Um, unfortunately, with the constant terms and, and because of other factors, um, our efficiency was pretty much exactly what, what they observed, but um, at least um, asymptotically, our rate seems to be um, better than multi-level. Um, yeah, and okay, and then the next example, which is a PDE example. So here um, we have to use finite elements also in combination with our estimator. So the the setting is this: we have a metal plate that we want to heat up, and um, yeah, so we apply a heat source at the lower left corner. We have here sensors that measure the temperature and the expansion of the material, and yeah, as the as the material heats up, you can see here on the right the, the temperature increases, and so the one question is where do we place the sensors? We say we can move them along the top boundary here, and the um, the other question is how long do we want to run this experiment? Right? If we stop it too early, we see that we we don't even pick up any really data here. If we let it run for too long, it will just reach some equilibrium state, and this this also doesn't make much sense. So yeah, those are the two questions: where where to place these sensors and how long to run the experiment. Okay, and here we see that we have a, a certain cost associated with solving this finite element formulation that is tau to the minus one, basically, um, depending on on of course how fast our our finite element solver um, decreases and how the cost blows up. Um, yeah, and the dimensions are kind of intermediate here, right? I I didn't mention before. I think before it was. Um, the outer dimension was 18 and the inner one 3. So, yeah, we can basically go as high as, as 100 or 200 dimensions here. But for our example, we, we were fine with these 15 and 3. Because again, okay, the inner dimension is, is the parameters. So these are kind of um, material property, right? The thermal expansion coefficient, heat per unit volume, and, and thermal conductivity that we want to analyze. And the design, as I mentioned, where to place the sensors and how long to run the experiment. And what we found here is that, okay, I, I keep the cost for solving the finite element separate here, 
but we get 1.87. So it's a little worse than for the other one, but we still beat the multi-level Monte Carlo and the double loop Monte Carlo, um, yeah, which I show here. And yeah, that's okay. So to wrap this up, um, yeah, our approach reduces the computational effort for estimating these nested integrals. Um, we face the problem of having this logarithm, which is um, infinite hardy cross variation. So we use Owen's work to deal with this case. And we can also show the, the near optimal number of samples. So basically balance the inner and outer number of samples. Um, yeah, we, we had to, to use a, a little bit of trickery there to um, solve this optimization problem um, to get these rates. But yeah, um, we confirmed numerically that our derivation also um, makes sense in practice. And what we uh, still would like to do, hopefully some, at some uh, point is to really analyze the, the interplay between the, the Laplace important sampling and the um, QMC approximation. And then of course also use multi-level techniques, which uh, yeah, we still can do here to maybe get even more efficient estimates. There, there, there is one work by, by Goda I would like to mention that already uses multi-level combined with uh, QMC or randomized QMC for the inner samples, but not for the outer ones. So as far as, as we're aware, this is, this is what, where we're headed. We would really like to, to combine again here, outer randomized QMC, inner randomized QMC, and then hopefully also multi-level. Okay, so that's it from my side.